My guest today, Stacey Schiff, is a Pulitzer Prize winning author. She has written several biographies of vivid historical figures, Benjamin Franklin and Cleopatra, among others, and a book about the grim events of the Salem witch trials. Her newest publication is The Revolutionary, a biography about Samuel Adams, who was described by Thomas Jefferson as the leader of the Revolutionary War and by his cousin John Adams as the man born to sever the cord between the crown and the colonies. Today, we will be discussing Samuel Adams, as well as the process of writing biographies and some facts that may surprise you about the individuals whom Schiff has profiled. I'm Julie Hartman, and this is Timeless. Hey everyone, and welcome to Timeless and the Julie Hartman YouTube channel in general. In addition to Timeless, you can catch my show with Dennis Prager here on this channel. It's called Dennis and Julie. It premieres every Monday at 1 o'clock Pacific, 4 o'clock Eastern, and you can catch Timeless Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays at the same time. It is great, as always, to be with you. And today, we are talking about probably my favorite subject in the world, and that is history. And I I especially love history when it pertains to the founding fathers, the people who built this great nation. So I am so pleased to welcome Stacey Schiff to the program. As I mentioned, she is a Pulitzer Prize winning author. Her biography of Benjamin Franklin, Great Improvisation, won the George Washington Book Prize and the Ambassador Award in American Studies. The New York Times praised Schiff's number one bestselling book on the Salem Witch Trials as, quote, Quote, an almost novelistic thriller like narrative. David McCullough, one of my favorite authors, called the book, quote, brilliant from start to finish. Schiff's book on Cleopatra, also a number one bestseller, was translated into 30 languages. Schiff is also the author of a biography on Vera Nabokov, wife of famous Russian novelist Vladimir Nabokov, and on Saint Excupery, who wrote The Little Prince. Her newest book, The Revolutionary, Samuel Adams, was named one of the Wall Street Journal's best 10 books of 2022. In addition to her books, Schiff has also written articles for The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The New York Review of Books, and The Los Angeles Times, among many other publications. So I guess you could say that she's a pretty talented author. Hello, Stacy. Welcome to the show. Hi, Julie. That was quite an intro. Thank you. Well, I have to admit, I think I butchered the name of Saint Excupery. I know that there's a very gorgeous sounding French way to say it, and my American accent was probably nails on a chalkboard to your it's not, ears. It's not, a, it's not a name that can be pronounced in English, and when he flew with American flyers at the end of his life, they just called him Saint X which is, you know, is perfect. You know, I wish I had known that before I (laughs) delivered this introduction, but, but good to know going forward for the rest of this discussion. As I told you, I'm such a fan of yours, and I really enjoyed this biography of Samuel Adams. Now, I read... Uh, that you are from Adams, Massachusetts. Did that play a role at all in your wanting to profile this founding father? I wish I could say it did, because then I would sound smarter than I am. (laughs) But it was almost just something that I kind of, you know, once I had settled on the subject, it felt somehow preordained, because there was this Adams connection. He's strangely unknown in Adams, Massachusetts, as he is, was pretty much everywhere, um, except today as a beer. But I fell into it more by reading what his contemporaries had said about him. I was working with some 18th century materials um, for something else and kept coming across these descriptions of him as the prime mover behind the revolution. And I just started wondering, who was this person whom the other founders seem unanimously to revere and whom we have lost complete sight of? Yes, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, Thomas Jefferson called him the leader of the Revolutionary War. He also called Adams, quote, the most active and persevering patriot. I have to tell you, it was a bit surprising reading your book and learning just how big of a role this individual played in the revolution. Before we get into that, for those who don't know much about Samuel Adams besides drinking beer named after him, can you provide a bit of a synopsis about Samuel Adams' life. Sure. I mean, it's an, it's an odd life in the sense that he's a well-born Bostonian 
who has two Harvard degrees, but as he comes to maturity, never really finds a profession. So here he is in the 1740s and the 1750s, sort of just a, a man about town in Boston, not really thriving in any way. His family had had a fortune and lost it. But he's really kind of writing for papers, but doesn't really have a foothold. And suddenly, with incursions into colonial rights, with this question of how far does Parliament, Parliament's sovereignty um, extend, he kind of comes into, you know, sort of bursts into technicolor existence and begins to help give voice to the colonial opposition to British legislation. The first, the first real political act is his, he's the person who pens for the Massachusetts legislature their opposition to the Stamp Act. And that pulls him into a political career. So that over the next really 15 years, until 1776, he he is the person who best articulates, um, most builds coalitions around, um, and gives the loudest voice to the ideas that we consider the fundamentals to that on which the revolution are founded. He's the person who really affects the change in thinking that precedes the actual fighting in the revolution. Yes, that's what John Adams, his second cousin, called the revolution that precedes the revolution. Isn't that right? And I think, yeah, and I think we lose sight of how dramatic, I mean, what a full-scale evolution in thinking that is and how fast it actually happens. I mean, these are colonies who go from spotlessly loyal to, as the Crown sees it, stark raving mad in the course of basically a dozen years. And he's really at the forefront of that revolution. You describe Samuel Adams as a, quote, master propagandist. Why do you describe him as such? Well, he is a diligent and relentless, I guess you could say, writer of newspaper pieces. And he begins early in, as I said, articulating these ideas and continues almost weekly at various times through these years, writing in essentially the Boston Gazette and the Boston Evening Post and in pages that will then be disseminated throughout the rest of the colonies. And he's able to take events, say, for example, the Boston Massacre, and in his writing, amplify those events so that everyone on the eastern seaboard um, is able to read about them. He's the person who comes up with the name Boston Massacre. He's the person who seems to be at Paul Revere's elbow when Revere is making that engraving many of us know of the troops firing on civilians that day, which bears no no resemblance whatsoever to what actually happened that day. He's the person who will relitigate the entire Boston Massacre after John Adams has essentially seen to it that the soldiers who fire that day are exonerated in court. So um, it's it's often propaganda. Much of it is very high-minded, idealistic stuff. Some of it is very slanted and biased material. Hmm. Now, I've listened to some interviews that you have done where you talk about how John or excuse me, Samuel Adams is a very vibrant writer. And, and you just talked about how he wrote for many years under various pseudonyms. For those who are not acquainted with the writings of Samuel Adams, which probably is 99 percent of Americans, <laughs> probably 99.9 percent .9 of Americans. What are some things that you would point to? What are the top like three to five must read letters or newspaper articles of Samuel Adams that you would recommend? I'm not sure there's a short list, but I think there's a short list of ideas, which you can see really okay. from beginning to end because he's so consistent. So under something like 32 pseudonyms, and, and probably there are more, but those are the ones that I've been able to identify. He starts out very early on asking the question, is obedience to the crown required if the sake of if, if the republic is if the republic stands in jeopardy, in other words, if the king invades the people's rights, do they owe the king their obedience? And that's an odd question to be asking in the 1740s when no one had really asked that question before. But he continues to pose that question for years. You know, the rights of the the rights of the governed and the rights of the government should be in perfect equipoise, as he sees it. And once one begins to invade the other, there's a problem. And he's from the get-go, essentially insisting on this idea that the government should, the governed should have little and the people should have a great deal, and that basically industry should prevail over, over privilege and over hereditary wealth. He has a real, there's a real anti-elitist streak in his, in his writing. And this idea that, as he sees it, a small circle of inbred families control everyone's destiny, as seemed to be the case in New England, is very much a sort of microcosmic view of what he sees as happening with the crown, that basically everyone is being strangled by these legislations in which they have no say. And that's the kind of thing on which he's essentially harping over and over again. 
often in very, very sort of um, beautiful rhetorical flights of fancy, but but very consistently over the years. Who would you say were Samuel Adams' biggest influences? Well, certainly John Locke. He seems to have swallowed John Locke whole. And if you read if you read the early pieces, there's really a, a wholesale recycling of John Locke. Um, at the time he is at Harvard, so we're talking the 1740s. John Calvin and John Locke have sort of met halfway. So there's a great there's a great religious streak. There's a very puritanical streak in Adams' thinking and in his writing, and that combines very much with 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 Locke's ideas on society. So those are really the two sort of obvious thinkers. He's read the classics, as did everyone who went who went through Harvard in these years, or everyone who's educated as Adams was educated. And there's a constant appeal back to, as with all the founders, the Roman Republic and these ideas that um, that seem to them to be the ideals, the sterling ideals on which they stand. I know that historians tend to balk at counterfactual history, but if you don't mind, just please indulge me for a moment, <laughs> because I'm so curious contemplating these ideas. Let's say Samuel Adams had never been born. How would the lead up to the American Revolution, in your judgment, have been different? And that includes the Continental Congress, which I know Samuel Adams played such a big role in. How would those things, again, in your judgment, have been different? Well, first, let me just balk because I need to because I don't do counterfactual history. Um, <laughs> but let me point let me let me point to it a different way. It, certainly, the revolution would have happened. He's by no means the only person pointing up what he considers to be these these this overreach on the part of the crown. Hmm. It happens on a more accelerated schedule, surely, because of Samuel Adams's various interventions. And I guess I would say that there are certain things which he contributes, and I guess this goes to your earlier question about who exactly is he, certain things he contributes that no one else really has got their minds around. And some of that is the boycotting and the non-importation agreements and the sort of petitioning that he does in Boston. There's a huge amount of street theater. He's he's able to involve the women and children of Boston in this effort. This is really sort of right at the heart of what we today consider to be really smart civil resistance theory. And he seems to have nailed it, you know, without having read a guide on civil resistance theory. But he's also unbelievably nimble when it comes to essentially co-opting institutions. So that very early on, he manages to see to it that his voice and the voice of his friends becomes the dominant voice of the Massachusetts House. And very quickly, he's able to detach the other governing um, assembly in, in Boston from the governor. The governor's council basically becomes an extension of Adams and his colleagues. And he'll do the same thing later, really, with the Continental Congress, where these these bodies of people are making decisions which should have been being made by elected officials. And in fact, Adams has seen to it that the power has migrated to the people rather than to the authorities. Why did Samuel Adams not have a more prominent role in the American Revolution once it began? Well, a couple of things. First of all, he's older than everyone else. I mean, basically, he, he's not as old as Franklin, but he's of another generation. So you know, people like Jefferson and Madison could have been his children. He's 13 mm-hmm. years older than John Adams. He's 15 years older than John Hancock. Um, and they're at the older end. Certainly, he's not a committed federalist. So after the revolution, he sort of finds himself intellectually homeless because, you know, the federalists rule. And, and, and he spends an inordinate amount of time in Congress working on sort of put, keeping the government going, which is a really thankless, unglorified task. And it's, sort of, and it's somewhat, I think, invisible when he's there for those years. You know, there's, no, there's no role in the fighting, obviously. Um, and there's a great deal of damage done to his reputation after the war, Um, partly because of falling out with John Hancock, partly because of falling out with the Federalists, partly because of confusion with John Adams, and partly because he never preens for posterity the way other founders did, like John Adams. So when, when John, for example, says to him, you must collect your papers, they will explain the revolution as no other set of documents could, Samuel Adams never makes a collection of his papers. He never writes a memoir. And so he almost writes himself out of the story. That must be very frustrating for you as a historian, but also kind of a fun puzzle or enigma to uncover. Both, both of the above, but I would stress the frustration much more. I yes, mean, there, I bet. You know, we have these accounts of him burning his papers because he, you know, he's essentially committing treason. So he's, of course, you know, doing everything he can to erase fingerprints. But of course, in erasing the fingerprints, the documents we today would like to most to consult have gone are, are, are missing. 
That makes sense, you know, for his time that he may want to destroy those documents because, as you say, he was committing treason. But if he was thinking long term, he would it seems to me that the that the logical conclusion would be to preserve as much about his record as he could so that it would age well. Do you think he had any kind of consideration of the long term legacy he would have? I think that he in in the sense of the long term legacy, he as a man of deep piety was really thinking about how he was going to you know meet his maker and he wasn't thinking of generations hence and and i think it was really an act of tremendous self-preservation to be destroying these papers because you know these are the papers that would have revealed to us you know the workings behind the boston tea party the workings behind the committees of correspondence this was a point where you know he was very often threatened with arrest he read very often that he was going to be chained and deported to to london for trial he didn't want that to happen to his friends. He was perfectly dauntless when people said he was likely to be arrested, but he certainly didn't want that same fate to befall any of his Confederates. So as I mentioned, you also wrote a biography of another founding father, Benjamin Franklin. How does Benjamin Franklin and his disposition and his ideas compare with Samuel Adams' dispositions and ideas? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. You know, I, it's funny. I, I, I have such an uh, such an abiding love of Franklin. Mm. Franklin is considered by Samuel Adams for a very long time insufficiently revolutionary because Franklin, as, as we know, is in London for most of these earlier years. He's very much intent on some kind of reconciliation between colonies and crown. He doesn't believe there should be a rupture. Only at the very last minute is he is he does he become a revolutionary. And interestingly, it's. It's indirectly because of the work, because of Samuel Adams, that Ben Franklin essentially becomes a radical. And that's because the credit for the Boston Tea Party or the discredit, as the Crown saw it, um, which falls squarely on Samuel Adams' shoulders, is attributed in London to Benjamin Franklin, who is derided publicly, publicly humiliated for what the Crown believes to be his role in the Boston Tea Party. And it is that public hum- humiliation that will make of him a revolutionary. So an interesting, there's an interesting echo, in a way, between the two. But for most of those years, Adams isn't quite sure where Franklin stands. Most people in America were, in the, in the colonies weren't quite sure where Franklin stood and worried that he was too intent on, on he's too, too much a moderate man, too much intent on holding together, as he put it, that noble China vase, the British Empire. Later, they do work together in Congress, and there is one point where the Middle Atlantic states are very hesitant about independence. Um, Adams and Franklin, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts are very much in the forefront, and the two of them agree that if they can't get the other colonies um, to go along with them, then they will attempt to do something together. Mm. You know, one of the things that fascinates me the most about this time period, the founding of our country, is that there seemed to be almost this divinely inspired conglomeration of truly brilliant individuals. And as you just outlined, you know, they were they were not the same by any means. And as I learned from your biography of Samuel Adams, they had strifes with one another. I mean, Samuel Adams had a kind of love hate relationship with with John Hancock, to give an example. But still, despite these individuals differences, what unified them was that they truly were brilliant, so learned, so well read, and principled and so determined to bring about this this revolution. What do you think it was about the time period, about the setting, the the places in which they lived in the 13 colonies that produced this, again, kind of uh, orchestra of just utterly brilliant individuals? You know, that's the million dollar question. I think there are a few hints of things which help us to understand it better. I think it's an age where you could actually be truly, a, truly be a Renaissance man, where you really could, and I say man for good reason, where you really could have read almost everything there was out there to read. I mean, there was very little Ben Franklin hadn't read that was available at the time. And that's something, of course, that would never be true today. But there was a core curriculum in a funny way that was familiar to all of these, all of these men. You know, it, we shouldn't have said to the fact that when, these, when that assembly of delegates first comes together in Philadelphia, they are utter foreigners to each other. They, they worship in different ways. They divide a, a dollar into a different number of shillings. They speak English very differently. They're very much strangers to each other. And mm-hmm. yet, of course, as you know, we know from John Adams, they, they begin 
the clocks all chime on this at the same moment, right? They finally do come together. Some of that is obviously the urgency of the moment. Their interests are made to align. But you could also say their interests don't align because you have, you know, exceptional questions like slavery that are never resolved at the time. But the urgency of having to do something about the relationship with the crown was greater than all of the other, all the differences that stood, stood among these men. I mean, you really do have a, you have a series of intellectual giants, but you also have a moment that really brought out the best in them. Before we continue, I want to tell you about my pillow. I use many my pillow products. I walk into work every day wearing the my slippers, and then I quickly change into heels. I sleep on the my pillow in the Giza Dream bed sheets, and I use my towels among other products. And you can get many of these products at a discount if you use the promo code Hartman. MyPillow's latest deal is the sale of the year. For a limited time, you'll get 60% off of the aforementioned Giza Dream Bed Sheets that comes with a 60-day money-back guarantee and a 10-year warranty. You'll get a set for as low as $39.99 with the promo code Hartman. Just go to MyPillow.com and click on the radio listener square and use the promo code Hartman or call 1-800-566 Six seven four five, and use the promo code Hartman. Along with this offer, you'll get deep discounts on all My Pillow products, including the My Pillow mattress topper, the My Pillow towel sets, and more. I mean, you really do have a you have a series of intellectual giants, but you also have a moment that really brought out the best in them. Mm. It's a very good point. You know, I, I want to add that one of the things that surprised me most when I was reading this biography is that Samuel Adams kind of had an unimpressive life for the first 40 years of his life. And then when he turned 40, he really kind of found this cause, which became the vocation of the rest of his life. And that was resisting the what he saw as the tyrannical rule of the crown. But I just wanted to tell that to the audience, because if you're ever feeling like your life isn't going particularly well, look at Samuel Adams, who who is someone who many of us still revere today. And again, for the first four decades, for correct me if you if you think I'm being ungenerous, but it seems as though he had sort of an unimpressive life. No, no, you're spot on, and he's a, he is a perfect failure until middle age, which I I agree with you. I find immensely endearing in, in every possible way. Right? It's, it's it's thrilling to see this person, as I said, just burst into technicolor suddenly, and that may also explain something about that moment that you have people who, you know, from different backgrounds and with different strengths, suddenly find themselves find themselves aligned. That's right. And there's, there's very little in those early years of Adams is where you can actually see the talents that are going to drive him forward. You don't see the tenacity. You don't you see the serenity and the, and the charisma a little bit, but you don't see that genius for coalition building. You don't see the tenacity. You don't necessarily even see his gift for language. Mm. So did it really just come out during the the time leading up to the revolution? What what happened to kind of bring him out of his shell in this great way? Well, I think to some extent there is the there is the moment. This is a man meeting his moment in a really unusual way. To some extent as well, because of those years when he's kind of out on the streets of Boston, not really amounting to anything, but yet comes from this very privileged background, he's in a unique position really among the founders to be able to unite sort of the high and the low. He can speak to the dock workers in Boston. He can speak to the ministers of Boston. And that gives him a very unique vantage point when politics really begin to, when the political environment really begins to heat to be able to sort of bring people together. Mm. And, you know, this is this we know from the descriptions of John Adams. He's tremendously affable, a little formal in his manner, but very affable and very charming. And that also helps him, obviously, to suddenly convince people that they need to take a stand and a principled stand at that. Speaking of political moments, what do you think Samuel Adams and Benjamin Franklin would have thought of the state of politics and the political divisions that we have right now in the United States? Yeah, that's up there with counterfactual history. I mean, just, <laughs> you know, I keep sneaking idea, it in there. I know. I love the way you do that, Julie. It's so clever. Um, <laughs> you know, just as, just as you know, the idea of political parties would have so appalled them. You know, if you look at the founders, as you as you alluded to earlier, it's really interesting that almost all of them fall out one with another. There are just so many feuds among them in the end. You know, these are not these are not demigods by any stretch. Um, but that but to see the principles for which they fought so strongly go missing because of personal animus and other and other reasons, I think would mortify each and every one of them. Yes. 
I'm I'm so glad you say that because when I read books about the founding fathers, including yours, and I and read about these conflicts, I think how were they able to overcome that? But we get so upset with each other, write people off from our lives for strifes that we have that that are um, nothing in comparison to the kinds of things that these individuals argued over. So mm-hmm, it, exactly, it's a very, very important point. You know, we, we could talk about the founding fathers for the rest of the episode, but I would be remiss if I did not turn to some other questions about your your other books and, of course, the process of writing biographies. That, that so interests me. I heard in an interview that you did, and I loved this, I have to tell you, that, and maybe it's changed, I think this was the C-SPAN interview that you did about 10 to 15 years ago, but you remarked in that interview that you start your writing process on literally with a pencil and a notepad of paper. Is that still how you go about writing? Oh, Julie, it's worse than that. I not, not only start with a legal pad and a pencil, but I end with a legal pad and a pencil. It's the only way that I seem to be able to get words on paper. I'm a very fast typist, and I do not think as quickly as I type. And I mm. just feel as if there's something about the, the the physical act of pencil on paper is actually really, especially now that we're used to typing all the time, is actually arduous. It's not easy to write. My, you know, my handwriting has disintegrated along with everyone else's. <laughs> but it's, it, it slows you down just enough for the thoughts to catch up with you, at least in my case. And I also feel as if I write with more concision if I'm writing by hand because it is arduous. Whereas if I'm typing, you know, it's, I, I could go on a great length because there's just sort of no, you know, it's seamless. There's just no friction there whatsoever. How do you do that? I mean, for pages and pages and chapters, and these are extraordinarily well-researched, heavily detailed books. I, I just don't understand how you have the time and your hand doesn't fall off during this process. Well, remember that I, that I, I mean, I would love to say I wrote, you know, four pages a day, but that would be a good day. I probably am lucky if I get two and a half to three and a half pages written a day. And then once they're written, I do type them into the computer. Mm. And that's really the first edit. The first edit is, you know, retyping what I have laboriously written by hand. And in doing so, obviously, I'm shaping a little bit what I've already written once. And then from then on, I'm either editing on the screen or printing out drafts, that, which are typewritten drafts. I have to it's tell really you just that first time through that's the, that's the dinosaur method. That so inspires me because I I find when I'm just, you know, I try to write a lot of articles and just sitting on the computer and typing them out, I feel like I, it's not the best use of of my time and the the best uh, kind of process for my writing. So hearing that really inspired me and I wanted to share that with the audience in case there are any writers out there, maybe this is the secret to to your success. Clearly, you're doing something right, because you just have one hit after the other. And the, the process, I think, is revelatory. You know, so we talked at the beginning of the episode, or at least I mentioned the the various individuals who you have written about to, to remind the audience, Vera Nabokov, the wife of Vladimir Nabokov, who was the author of Lolita, Benjamin Franklin, of course, Samuel Adams, of course, Saint X. Thank you very much for giving me that out so I don't have to, there you re- go. There you go. to repeat his name, Cleopatra. And then, of course, you wrote the book on the Salem witch trials, which hopefully we will have time to discuss. But, you know, I notice that you write biographies of people who seem to have a high tolerance for risk. Do you agree with that observation? And if you do, why do you think it is that you gravitate towards those individuals? You know, it's funny. I'm often asked what the unified theory is among all the books, and I have never been able to put my finger on one. So maybe you just named it, Julie. It's the, it's the appetite for risk. I, I mean, my, my glib answer would be that you, no one accomplishes anything without an appetite for risk. So anyone you're going to want to write about is, by, by definition, a risk taker. Mm-hmm. Um, among risk takers, I'm not sure anybody outshines Samuel Adams. Certainly Ben Franklin doesn't outshine Samuel Adams when it comes to risk taking. Um, I mean, the Nabokovs, I feel, are more sort of the victims of history in many ways. I mean, obviously, he's a literary genius, but they're being bounced around the globe as having not so much risk-taking, obviously, as having been the victims of history, because they are, you know, so many times transplanted from one country to the next. Um, Cleopatra is obviously an inveterate risk-taker, but I think any sort of political figure by definition has an appetite for risk. Mm. Um, 
And Santa Exupery crashed his airplane more times than I can count, so definitely <laughs> most decidedly a risk taker um, in that respect. I think there's something there, that something, it's a flip side of ambition in some way, I guess is what I'm saying. Is anyone who, who dares to accomplish something is probably leaning into risk. Hmm. I heard you say somewhere, or perhaps I read it in, in one of your articles, you, you said, quote, when you take someone out of context, you see them better. What did you mean by that? So that was something that, it, that dawned on me as I was writing about the Nabokovs, who obviously leave Russia during the Russian Revolution, moved to Germany, leave Germany during the rise of Hitler, moved to France, leave France as, as France falls and move to America and then buy literary success are propelled finally back to Switzerland where they spend the rest of their lives. And when you see them speaking a language that is not necessarily, not necessarily the one in which they are most comfortable, when you see them out of context, um, it's like any of us. There, certain things stick out. They don't blend into their, their natural habitat quite as much. And I think from that lesson, I moved on to, to writing about Franklin and his eight and a half years in France and realized that it was a time in Franklin's life that was not only hugely valuable because we for once have Franklin completely out of context and not at his ease and, and really not speaking eloquently because when he first gets to France, his French is rudimentary. Um, but it's the years that he considers the greatest, most important, most taxing ones of his life. So here you have what he considers to be his, his really chief contribution to the country's founding. And you have him in a way where we can see him more clearly than he appears when he's here in the colonies. Hmm. So um, that was part, that was part of the logic for for writing about that those years that they were underwritten about partly because they're very difficult to research, and also it was a different Franklin from any I think that we had seen before. Is there one individual who you've written a biography about who really surprised you? Like you uncovered something about them or the people who they associated with that was really just shocking and unexpected. I think they all surprise you. If, I think if they didn't, you you would want it to be in a different line of work. I think that's the <laughs> beauty of it is that, you know, with Cleopatra, for example, I must have written half the book before I realized really fully how shrewd and strategic she was in her thinking. And I had to go back and sort of layer some of that shrewdness into the earlier chapters. I and mean, it took me a while to realize that she was more, she was a very wily woman and it took me a while to realize that. So I think there are always surprises, um, that you, that you uncover along the way. And then you always, you always come up with some wonderful cache of documents that suddenly puts new light on the material, or you fail to come up with a cache of documents that might have you know, shown new light on the material. And so you have these, you're, you're kind of trying to move into the spots which are more illuminated by the materials you have. Mm. I wish that we had more time to to talk in, in greater detail about these individuals in the Salem Witch Trials book, which I told you before the interview, I'm about a quarter of the way through, and it is just riveting. And I think an especially important book to read now during this, this time in the United States where there's um, sort of a similar cancel culture, though, of course, the ones the one in 1692 was far worse than the one now. But, but, but there's a but you're absolutely right. There's a tremendous parallel there. Yes. It's almost it, it's, it's yeah, it's kind of spine tinglingly topical. Yeah, agreed. Well, I'll just have to have you back on the show to discuss these in more detail when we have more time. Thank you so much for the time that, that you have given today. And as I said, I'm a huge fan of yours. I'd like to recommend to everyone Stacy's most recently released book, The Revolutionary Samuel Adams. And by the way, I forgot if I mentioned this on the air. I know I acknowledged it to, to Stacy off the air, but I learned from you that you should call him Samuel Adams. When you call him Sam Adams, it actually has come to kind of be a term of disrespect. So throwing that out there for the for the fans of Founding Fathers, say the full name. Thanks so much, Jill. It was a delight. Where can people find you if they want to see your articles and, and some of your work? Um, my website is Stacey Shift, is www.stacyshift.com, and I am on Twitter. Excellent. Thanks again, Stacey. Great to talk with you. Thanks, Julie. And thanks to all of you for joining me. I'll see you soon. <laughs>